Hi, and welcome again to the Waterbury Health Podcast. I'm Jeremy Rodrigo, your host. Today is the last day of Breast Cancer Awareness Month. It's actually Halloween that we're taping this. And joining me today are our breast surgeon, uh, Dr. Liz Reardon, and a new plastic surgeon in our area, Dr. Leo Otaki. And we're going to talk about breast cancer and breast health and some of the, the a patient's journey when they're uh, experiencing breast cancer and they go through the whole process. And Dr. Reardon, why don't we start with talking about um, how a patient gets to you? Okay. So obviously our little community here at Waterbury Health is made up of many different professionals, practitioners. So when it comes to female or women's health, mm -hmm. the most likely entry into my world is either their primary care or their OBGYN. Right. So I would say primarily 75% of patients come to me with referral for those individuals. However, we do very readily accept patients who notice problems on their own. Right. Pain, nipple discharge, they're concerned because every female they're related to has cancer. So the door is open, however right. people can get to us. And your office is on Grandview Avenue, and then you have another office in Southbury. Correct. Right. And in each location, my office is complexed with diagnostics radiology associates. Right. The imaging specialists. Right. So very commonly, we work together to identify problems on mammogram and ultrasound, and they can come straight to me and vice versa. So in both locations, we have the ability to take care of patients real time and quickly. How quickly can somebody get in to see you if they have, if, they, if the primary care sends you for a visit, you know, for a referral, or they want to come on their own? How quickly can you get in? Well, it depends what they're coming for. Yeah. So if someone has an imaging problem that suggests there's something that requires immediate attention or a biopsy, yeah. we have made a commitment to the, the department that we would see that patient within 24, 48 hours. And that's important because when you get that abnormal whatever, and you, I'm just guessing as you're a patient, you want to see a specialist right away. Amen. You need to know right away. And I think that's why I really love what your office does is like, get them in here. Let's go. Let's get them in let's, here. And let's let's, go, let's get going. Let's right. figure out what's going on. I will tell you, though, if I could address all primary care and OBGYNs <clears throat> everywhere, yeah. I would humbly ask them to, in limited means, tell the patient why they're coming. Because a majority of patients that come to me have been told to go to a breast surgeon. They're not quite sure why they're coming to me, but the only thing they hear are, oh my God, I'm being sent to a breast surgeon. I must be dying. Because I ask people, and I watch as I give a, a, a tech to what it is they're here for, whether it's a change in their mammogram or a little something on their ultrasound. Yeah. I see the fear melt sure. from their face just by kind of telling them what it is, right. how small it might be. So I would urge all practitioners, I don't expect a primary care physician to know how to read a mammogram. Yeah. I yeah. don't expect them sure. to sit 45 minutes on the phone with the patient to let them know what they may or may not see in my office. That's what I'm for. Just send them along, we got that part. Yeah. So, so that's how most patients come to me. So once they do come to me, Ideally, they're coming before a diagnosis has been made. That allows me to go over with their imaging, right. whatever the problem is, to do a good physical examination before they've had a biopsy. That way, I get to feel everything and see everything yeah. before it's changed. Right, and you're the expert, right? And, and so one of the things that I like about you that I've heard from your patients is you spend as much time as the patient needs, as much time as you need, Nothing is rushed. Correct. Nothing. There's no need to rush. We give our patients, especially our first appointments, plenty of time because we know yeah. no one wants to be in my office. No one wants to be sent to my office. It's already an anxiety-filled uh, environment. So we try very hard to put things in perspective that the patient can understand, no lofty language. And I try to keep things limited as we go so as not to upset anyone. Yeah. Ultimately, they have whatever procedure or biopsy, mm -hmm. and then they come back to me. That's also standard in my office. If I'm going to order a biopsy, 
I'm going to make an appointment with you usually five to seven days afterwards so we can talk about it together. Yeah. It's not a phone call. Right. And uh, I think that's my own um, self-motivated, I guess Your it's process. born out of my process, but uh, I've been in situations where practitioners have picked up a phone to give a, a woman um, a bad news. And nowadays, most everyone has a cell phone that they can take anywhere. Well, what if you're bringing your daughter to soccer practice or you're in the middle of your job? You pick up the phone because it's ringing and you see it's my office. Yeah. I think one of the cruelest things you can do to somebody is give them that kind of news and then not be able to sit down and have a hour, two hour discussion right. of well, what exactly that means. Yeah. I just told you what's going on, and let me tell you what this all means and what our path forward right. is. It's, hey, this is what's happening. Goodbye. We'll see you in the office at some point. To me, that's cruel. Now, right. some that's, patients will tell you, yeah. I want you to tell me the minute you know. Yeah. So if somebody really kind of twists my arm, and I'll do what the patient wants. I'm always yeah, team patient. But, but it's my preference to have the luxury, if you will, of sitting down, explaining it, because really, it's only when you get into the details that you can really allow the patient to, to get an, a handle on what's going on. And when you consider that over 75% of breast cancers diagnosed in this country don't die from their disease, that's a big number. That's because we're finding it earlier and we're getting better at treating it. But when people hear the word cancer, Right. They don't know that, and they assume that's not going to be them. So it is a conversation to bring people down. Yeah. So once we have a diagnosis, and I have the ability to talk to the patient and let them know, the realms or the, the, the avenues for treatment is multimodality, meaning it's not just a surgical diagnosis and treatment. It's not just a medicine. It's not just radiation. We all work together very closely together based on the standards of care established in our fields by the bodies that collect all the evidence that do all the research. Right. And, and everything we, that you do is based on research and evidence. And correct. You're, you're continually learning every day, correct. learning more and more about your, your Absolutely. Your and we make that commitment uh, here at Waterbury Hospital, <clears throat> Waterbury Health, mm -hmm. as well as St. Mary's. We all work very closely with our Harold Lever Cancer Center friends, yeah. because that's where the team is complete. Yeah. So we talk in open forum, presenting each and every new diagnosis. So we get consensus of care. Every individual on the team, radiologists, pathologists, surgeons, oncologists, we all come with different perspective, but we also come with our own information. And so in an open forum, we're able to really help that patient's treatment plan be fettered out based on those same standards. So every patient gets that in our, in our world. So you have a patient, you've gone through this process of identifying what it is and you have to make a determination that they need some surgery, right? And I want to tie Dr. Otaki in at some point because I think this is important that when we talk about the journey and there's surgery and then there's reconstruction after surgery. Amen. So let's talk about that. Well, as we've talked about, cancer diagnosis is very disruptive to a person's life. So the treatment part obviously is heralded as the most important part, yeah. but it's not the only important part, right? We have to make sure there's no barriers to care that people can get to their appointments. We have to make sure that their mental wellness, their health, and that's one good thing that Harold Lever does is we have uh, social workers, nutritionists, a lot of people to take care of the whole patient. It's not, you're not just a breast cancer walking into me. Right. So we take care from the get-go, everything for that patient, whatever that patient needs. So from a surgical standpoint, my job is to get rid of the tumor mm -hmm. and at times check lymph nodes to see if that cancer has spread. Now in somebody who's very large breasted, that little bit of surgery, if it's indeed a small amount of surgery, may still change the way their breast looks to them. Yeah. So what I do is important in terms of taking away the cancer. But I want that woman to be just as happy with the final outcome. 
the way things look to her, because she's the one that has to live with the way she looks every single day. So there's been a huge concentration, especially in the last 10 years, on oncoplastic techniques. In summary, cancer treating surgical techniques, mm -hmm. coupled with making the final process look good. So whether we're just doing a lumpectomy, taking the tumor out but leaving the rest of the breast, or for select patients taking off the breasts, I fairly frequently turn to my friend Dr. Otaki as a wonderful, kind, and talented plastic surgeon to make sure that what I do can be converted into something that looks good for the patient. So let's make this transition. Now, you've done your part, mm -hmm. you've done the surgery, you've removed um, either a, a lump or all of the breast or whatever, and, and you've taken care of the cancer part, right? And now we go over to Dr. Otaki. What, so what does that interaction look like? You, how does that handoff happen? Well, we're lucky in the sense that Dr. Otaki is now embedded in my office. Oh, that's so easy. Our, it's, it makes it a lot easier. <laughs> our office staff takes care of the appointments for both of us. So it's not unusual, and this is the reason why we did this, is the patient will come to see me to go through their cancer talk, but the next half hour or 45 right. minutes or hour, however it takes, they'll see Dr. Otaki right then and there. So we work in concert, in tandem. Yeah. I talk about my portion. He goes over his portion, and the office staff is there to schedule it all together. It just makes it easier for yeah. anybody required. And it's not all patients. Not all patients need plastic surgery if it's a small cancer and yeah. there's not an issue cosmetically, but fairly frequently there is. So that's how we've arranged that, that handoff, if you will. <laughs> so, Dr. Otaki, they get you. You come over. What is your first interaction with that patient like? Tell, tell us about that. Sure. I uh, reintroduce the whole concept of the team, as Dr. Reed indicated, that there are multiple facets in terms of one's cancer care, many other disciplines. It's a multidisciplinary team. And so the initial interaction, I would start out by saying, we're all on the same team together to beat cancer. Yeah. Um, once that's been accomplished, and there will be a day, it's hard to envision that because, again, patients have just gotten this news, this diagnosis. I do try to paint that picture down the road where there will be a day when the cancer piece is behind you and you have the rest of your life to look forward to. Right. And that facet of the puzzle is what I work on where we make sure that we let these patients live their best life moving forward. Yeah. And as Dr. Reardon indicated, you know, there's a significant amount of psychological burden once the cancer has been taken care of in terms of what's my life going to look like? Uh, how are my interactions with family, friends, uh, my spouse, partner uh, yeah. going to look like? And that's the uh, interesting challenge of what I do. And to that end, I personalize the care to each individual person's needs. Uh, cancer is not a monolithic entity, and there's been a lot that's been said about this. Breast cancer and one person is not the same breast cancer as it is in another right. in terms of the nature of the disease, uh, the degree of its progression, and the, the treatments that are offered. And that can impact the, uh, the cosmetic uh, or the consequences of that down yeah. the road. So in any case, uh, once I make the introduction that this is a team effort, that they're in good hands, that they have many people taking care of their, uh, of their cancer care, I reassure them that we're going to put them back together, so to speak, yeah. in a way that gives them their highest quality of life. Now, as Dr. Reardon indicated, there are lots of ways to look at cancer treatment. In some cases, it could be a relatively uh, smaller operation in terms of its magnitude. It could be a partial type of mastectomy or removal of part of the breast tissue that may address the totality of their disease. In some cases, it may be necessary or advisable to remove all of the breast tissue, which would then entail a mastectomy. And so the fundamental challenges and uh, modes for reconstruction are different depending upon which of that initial pathway uh, is recommended and chosen by the patient. And so this was your training. Your training was <clears throat> plastic surgery, making, look, just in breasts, putting breasts back together so that 
person feels whole again. Correct. This has been a particular uh, focal interest of mine. Yeah. Uh, plastic surgery is obviously a very diverse uh, field. We fix uh, problems from head to toe, literally. Yeah, right. Uh, but it's been a particular uh, area of focus for me in my training, um, specifically during residency and after residency. I did a fellowship in uh, microvascular reconstruction, which focused a lot on on breast reconstructions, complex breast reconstructions, which we can talk about shortly. So it's an area of, of uh, keen interest of mine to, uh, again, maximize the quality of life for women. Uh, after they've uh, beaten breast cancer. And that's the thing is, as Dr. Reardon alluded to and we're talking about now is, now we're gonna put the person back together and make sure that they have, um, their identity is preserved. Whatever, you know, that identity has taken a big hit, right? In you've gone through the emotional and physical stress on your body about this cancer and now you've had part of your body removed and you wanna, still be that same person that you once were, you know, physically, and so we go to you. What is that process? How do you determine how you're going to go about this? And I, I, I realize that this is very complex and it's probably sure. a larger conversation, but how do you uh, meet with the, the patient sure. and say, I'm going to put you back together. Here's sure. how we're going to do it. Right. So again, it's a collaborative process. <clears throat> so. Uh, I need to first understand the, the degree of disease and so the options which are available to the patient. And that's again in collaboration with Dr. Reardon and our colleagues in, in oncology and radiation oncology. So specifically, if a partial mastectomy is possible and patient choice is obviously a tremendous driver in this decision process, ultimately it's the patient's choice. Uh, we talk about breast conservation strategies, a lumpectomy or partial mastectomy versus a mastectomy. Um, in some cases, it may be more advisable to go the mastectomy route. Uh, and so patients are kind of advised in terms of the, the range of options that are available to them. They've been kind of front-loaded with that information based on uh, colleagues, primarily Dr. Reardon, to again, beat the cancer. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're all on the same team for this. Right. What are we going to do and offer to maximize the probability that our next conversation is the cancer piece is behind you? And so it's a combination of input from uh, my medical colleagues as well as, <clears throat> excuse me, input from the patient because again, it is a patient driven choice. Mm -hmm. um, so for example, if, uh, if a partial mastectomy or a lumpectomy were, uh, were available as an option, uh, to the patient and very frequently breast conservation is something that patients are keenly interested in. Uh, then we have options such as oncoplastic uh, techniques which Dr. Reardon spoke about. Fundamentally, she takes care of taking out all the bad guys, that's mm -hmm. how I describe it to the patients, and whatever um, area of the breast that needs to be then reconstructed, I take the surrounding tissues and reshape it and reform it into a breast mound, albeit smaller because right. by definition she subtracted away some tissue. And so we end up with a smaller, now pleasingly, aesthetically shaped breast. Uh, I always leave the uh, option open for patients to do contralateral or a balancing procedure because patients pick up on the thought that, well, she is, then I'm going to be kind of unbalanced. Right. And so we offer them the option of doing a so-called balancing procedure to make them symmetric. Okay. So we kind of take care of uh, a couple of problems all in one fell swoop in terms of getting rid of the cancer uh, putting the patient back together at the same operative setting so when she wakes up, at least that area of disease or question that's been removed, she's put back together, and then uh, those tissues go to the oncologists and pathologists to look at uh, next steps. So do you guys work in the mm -hmm. same operating room at the same time? Is that what you're saying? Correct. Mm -hmm. the, yes, oh, sir. I didn't know that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's, <clears throat> come on down for a visit. Yeah. <laughs> that's really interesting. So you're removing the tissue that needs to be removed, then you're putting it back together in the same Correct. operation. Correct. Oh, wow. And his talent is, you know, he plans the procedure, the incisions, with the idea of what he knows it's going to look like three months down the road, uh, okay. between swelling, plus or minus radiation, whatever. So when we, right before the surgery, we meet with the patient, obviously, yeah. before she or goes, goes under anesthesia. Leo is the one who will conceptualize how he's gonna do what he's going to do. So he actually makes markings on the patient's breasts to indicate where he wants the incisions to go so that 
when I do my part, he knows he can reconstruct it based on the image that he has for the patient, based on what needs to be replaced and where that tissue is on the breast itself. So, and then yeah, while I'm working on one side, we're not wasting minutes or time, he's already starting on the <laughs> other side uh, in persuading to that, that, that symmetry issue yeah, yeah. so that we can accomplish a lot of work in less time, but at the same setting. Oh, not right. all things can be done at it's the not same. It's always possible. Correct. But whenever possible, we when, try to do Absolutely. That. <laughs> Another way that Dr. Leo has really improved uh, a lot of women's lives are, um, even though the cancer might be small, for instance, if a woman presents to me, uh, especially a mature woman, she's done with her kids, and she's large-breasted, macromastia is the term, yeah. right? And she suffers from back pain, neck pain, yeah. has her whole life, right? So we have an opportunity not just to take out her cancer and make it look good, but she could have a reduction of both breasts concomitantly at the same time to not only treat her cancer, but to treat her underlying macromastia, wow. to give her breasts that are more appropriately shaped for her body, thereby maybe reducing her back pain, her neck pain. Now, it's a tough way to qualify for that operation, sure. but hey, if we can secure the bright light at the end of the tunnel, incidentally, that. We have a lot of very happy patients awesome. for that reason. So he has brought a tremendous satisfaction level to women's lives that aren't necessarily inherent in the process. So tell me about uh, someone who has a mastectomy. Sure. And how do you, how do you deal with that? So a mastectomy is a, is a larger proposal in terms of we're removing uh, all the underlying breast tissue mm -hmm. along with the cancer. Uh, and in some cases, we have to remove the nipple and the areola as a, as a part of removing the cancer itself. So now we're left with the skin of the breast. In order to reconstruct that, I typically place a device called a tissue expander, which is essentially a saltwater balloon. Okay. Uh, it's an implant where I could place it underneath the skin of the breast, close the skin, uh, and fundamentally what this tissue expander does is it preserves the three-dimensional shape and volume of the breast skin so that the breast skin remembers what it's like to be shaped like a breast. This gotcha. is what I tell patients is that in the absence of the tissue expander, the skin is going to stick down to the chest wall and once everything heals and scars down, that skin has forgotten what it was like to be shaped like a breast. It's possible to do a reconstruction at that stage, but it's much technically harder. Yeah. If we can capture that, the shape of the original skin envelope, uh, that's ideal. And so again, this is a setting where the cancer operation is the mastectomy. I place a tissue expander, essentially a placeholder, and basically that constitutes the operation. In some cases, we'll do both breasts uh, for a matter of risk reduction. If a patient has a genetic predisposition, for example, or a strong family history, uh, in some cases it's driven by patient choice. Um, but in any case, this uh, initial first stage reconstruction I do concurrently with the, uh, uh, with the breast surgeons, with Dr. Reardon. Uh, it's important that I say that, you know, this is a part, an important part of the reconstruction, but again, the oncology part, the beating the cancer part is foremost, because yeah. there are a lot of things that we don't know, okay? Even at the time of surgery, the day of surgery, there are some things we don't know that Dr. Reardon and I don't know, that we can't tell the patient because we won't know until the operation's done right. and the lymph nodes and the tissues have gone to the pathologist and they look at it with all their, their fancy microscopes and their right. stains and whatnot. And that takes time. They just, we just don't know all the information. And so the tissue expander, this first stage, acts as basically it's a placeholder, but it buys us time, okay? So we preserve our future options for an aesthetic reconstruction while we allow time for the pathologists and oncologists to figure out what, if any, moves need to happen uh, in that continuing battle to beat cancer. Gotcha. And so we've kind of put in our chip, so to speak, for, uh, for the reconstruction. Uh, once we have the tissue expander in place, that staline water balloon, we can expand it. Uh, I tell patients you can reinvent yourself to some degree. You could, you know, uh, they get to call the shots in that regard. But 
that whole process takes a few weeks and again it's in that time that the oncologist the multidisciplinary board can get together to optimize the cancer care for the patient in some cases the cancer care is done hallelujah you know the yeah. operation is essentially uh, was the was the main was the main uh, uh, thrust so to speak in terms of uh, beating the cancer and yeah. so now it's all about reconstruction so in some ways the patient has all the time in the world in all other cases, there may be need for, uh, for chemotherapy or radiation therapy. Mm -hmm. And so during the course of those therapies, which are an integral and important part of, of the uh, cancer care, this tissue expander is holding the place. So basically preserving you know, the future reconstructive potential uh, for that patient. Okay, so then after the pathology looks at everything and they've made sure. the determination one way or another, sure. let's say there's nothing further that needs to happen. Mm -hmm. The patient visits you again. Right. And now what happens? That's a great question. So we're kind of <clears throat> at, a, at a different place now. The, uh, um, the cancer specter is kind of behind uh, in the rear view mirror to some degree, and so it's a different conversation, but we're not done yet. So we've done the first stage reconstruction. Uh, the tissue expanders are in place, and we talk about the second stage. Uh, the options include either implants or utilizing one's own tissues, uh, skin and fat from the lower abdomen, uh, from the uh, medial thigh or posterior thigh, um, the buttock region as well. There are several different uh, options for reconstruction, although the uh, probably one of the best breasts, so to speak, would be on, on the patient's tummy. Um, the skin and fat of the lower abdomen. Mm -hmm. And that's called a DIEP flap. Uh, it's an acronym for the uh, perforating vessels that nourish that skin and fat of the uh, lower abdomen. And in that operation, uh, we take the skin, uh, the fat of uh, the uh, lower abdomen, and transplant it literally to the chest, uh, utilizing a microscope to reconnect uh, blood vessels that run on either side of the breastbone to uh, complete this transplantation of skin and fat from the tummy to the chest to uh, reconstruct breasts with the patient's own with tissues. patient's own tissue. Correct. Uh, in some cases now, uh, because uh, there are nerves that go to that skin and fat of the tummy, that's why when you tickle your tummy you can feel it, yeah. uh, we can actually reconnect uh, nerves that once uh, went to the nipple or innervated that area and uh, hook them up to the tissues so that uh, there can be some regrowth of the uh, nerves off of the chest wall into the, into the reconstruction tissue or to the nipple if that's still preserved uh, in order to increase the uh, sensation and patient satisfaction of this yeah. type of reconstruction. Um, this type of, uh, of advanced microvascular reconstruction is something that I, I went to for fellowship training uh, and again it's really Part of the uh, things that I'm, uh, the facets of what we offer that I'm passionate about in terms of really offering women uh, the opportunity for this type of reconstruction. And this is all done right here at Waterbury Hospital. Indeed, absolutely. But I mean, not all patients have that Correct. larger. Right. Sometimes they have the, the implant. implant reconstruction sure. too. And then so with the implants, which are again a uh, an excellent mode of reconstruction. Uh, the downtime is, uh, is a little bit less because, again, we're operating just exclusively in the breast as opposed right. to in the abdomen and the breast simultaneously. In that scenario, we take an implant, <coughs> excuse me, in that scenario, we take an implant, either a saline or silicone implant, uh, and essentially go through the same old scar, take out the expander, put the implant in. In some cases, in conjunction, we will do what's called fat uh, grafting, where uh, I would harvest fat by means of liposuction, mm -hmm. just in the standard way that we would do in the cosmetic sense. But instead of throwing that fat away, we repurpose that fat um, and essentially inject it underneath the skin of the reconstructed breast between the skin and the implant to uh, add a little bit more soft tissue volume to the implant reconstructed breast to give it a softer, more natural appearance. Yeah. And so these are technical improvements on implant-based reconstructions that have developed over the years. And how long is this typical journey from visiting Dr. Reardon to visiting Dr. Otaki to walking out of Dr. Otaki's office after the last visit saying everything Well, it's is, very dependent on the cancer. Is it so? Is it yeah. So? yeah, it is. Yeah. Well, because, for instance, uh, let's just say, regardless of whether we spared the breast or had to remove it for a reconstruction, 
if that patient needs chemotherapy, well, they're not about to be allowed, if you will, to have a large reconstructive surgery until they've healed yeah, from sure. that. Yeah. If the tumor is large or there is positive lymph nodes, and in addition to medical therapy, they also need radiation therapy, which would obviously complicate what a reconstruction would look like from a patient satisfaction perspective. That might change what Dr. Otaki does too. So it's very, very yeah, it's uh, very, it's very patient specific, and mm -hmm. it's yeah, that was kind could of be a couple of weeks, could be half a year, three quarters of a year, yeah. depending on how many of the treatment options we have to employ to take care of that patient properly. Yeah, it, this is fascinating stuff, and and I'm so proud of our team here. And this is the third time you've been on my podcast. Yes, it is. And I'm so flattered a, to be you're back. You're a veteran. You're the most podcasted <laughs> surgeon we have. Why? Just thank so you. you. I'm I'm. I'm yeah, honored. Yeah, there we go. And um, as I'm always impressed by the level of care that we provide to our patients and their families, actually, and the level of cooperation and coordination and collaboration, I guess, of all of the providers, whether it be uh, you know surgeons or oncology or, ri or you know radiation, ra uh, radiology, all the imaging people, and your your office staff is amazing too. Mm -hmm. That. You know, everything is for the patient. We come in, the patient comes in with, you know, out of their mind and fear, and they're taken care of. They're kind of brought into this embrace of your office. And, and Waterbury for. Hospital. And Waterbury Hospital. I right. have to say that a majority, overwhelming a majority of patients come back to me and say, wow, you know, that preoperative team. Everyone was so kind, or the women in the recovery room were just so generous and kind and caring. If you needed radiology at the day of the surgery to localize the, where the tumor is so I can take it out, yeah. nothing but accolades. And so being, this is the place where I do all of my, my work, I'm extremely proud to be part of this entire family because patient care is really on the forefront of every aspect of that patient from when they walk in the hospital to when they're allowed to be discharged. Everyone works together in a, in a just a polite, respectful, pleasing way. And I hear it all the time that, and I try very hard to go back to people and say, just to let you know, Mrs. So-and-so just wanted me to tell everyone how much how she appreciated she right. it. So that's always lovely to hear that, and I hear it time and time again. So um, I think we all should be proud of what we do here because, yeah, we do care, and I think that does show in the, the, the care that we provide patients. Well, we're always happy to have you on the podcast, and you've been part of our team for a few years now, and we love having you. And you're relatively new, Dr. Otaki is new to our team, but um, a big um, um, addition to our family. Absolutely. Of, right? And we love what you're doing here for our patients and putting them back together and making them feel whole as people and uh, both emotionally and physically. We really appreciate that. I want to thank Dr. Leo Otaki, our plastic surgeon, and Dr. Elizabeth Reardon, our breast surgeon, for joining me today on the podcast. Awesome information. And I wanted to also extend. Um, if you need any donor fat, abdominal <laughs> fat, I have some that I've been saving for you if you need it. Absolutely. Uh, I'm waiting for that day. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We're waiting to waiting to crack that code. Yeah. Someday, someday we'll get there. Indeed. Thank you for joining on the podcast today. We'll catch you next time. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.